Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to Issues in Environmental Science for the week of uh, well, 8th of October. And this week we've been discussing the major biomes of Earth. This is chapter six in Hasenzal. Uh, we've been looking at how climate and geography affect biomes. And uh, let me share my screen. So we asked, how do climate and geography determine the biomes of Earth? And we focus on the terrestrial biomes over there. And we ask, what are the eco ecological characteristics of biomes? And uh, we looked at uh, different characteristics, including diversity, productivity, and stability. And then we ask, how does climate change affect biomes? Are the impacts distributed equally? and which uh, factors of climate change are likely to be most impactful. So we're going to be continuing this uh, discussion during today's class. So uh, before I uh, begin, I would like to discuss the midterm exam, which will be held one week from today, Thursday, the 15th of October. It's going to be online in two parts, and each part will be worth 50% of the total grade. The material covered will be all of the material that we've covered in class through the end of this week. So you will not be responsible for the chapter seven in Hasenzal until the uh, final exam. Uh, there'll be two parts to the exam. The first part will be a multiple choice exam, a multiple choice and a true false exam. And this will be comprised of 100 questions taken directly from the reading quizzes. So these will be questions that, that the students will have seen already and should have been able to answer. And so what I'm testing in this uh, component of the exam is your familiarity with the material covered by the reading and your ability to understand and make correct choices among uh, possible answers for basic questions that cover this material. So again, all of the material covered in the multiple choice exam will be material that you've seen before. Uh, you'll have uh, 75 minutes to complete uh, 100 questions taken, uh, as you know, as I said, from the reading quizzes that you've already had. Um, students who are registered with the SDRC can have 120 minutes to complete the exam. <clears throat> so what will happen on the Thursday is that we'll not meet here but I will, uh, the exam assignment will be open in Canvas. So you should log on to Canvas and the assignment will be open at 12.30 and then we'll close uh, for the body, the bulk of the class at the end of the regular class period. In other, in other words, uh, at uh, uh, 1.45. And then students who have SDRC accommodation will have uh, an extra uh, period of time to complete that. Part B will be uh, essay and diagramming questions uh, that will combine the weekly team questions that you've already answered and new questions that will be based on the lectures that I've been giving uh, during class. And the uh, uh, way to complete this portion of the exam will be uh, a file upload uh, with the Trinidad and Plagiarism check. So the question, exam questions will be open from 8 a.m on uh, the morning of Thursday the 15th, and will the exam will be closed. Um, in other words, all files have to be uploaded and submitted uh, by midnight on that day. Okay, uh, Sheelan, uh, you have a, you've raised your hand, go ahead and ask your question. Um, I think she just answered in the chat, we don't have on our lock. Okay. Um, so any other questions about the exam format or content? For the essay and diagramming questions, would you like us to type those out? Yes, please. They should all be typed. Yeah, I should have maybe said that. Kind of assumed that people are mostly typing. 
um, but for online format. And then uh, some of the exams, some of the components of the exam will include <clears throat> a diagram. So I'd like you to reproduce diagrams um, or tables. And you know, you may do may choose to do that uh, for any of the exams. Some of them will specifically require that. And any kind of material like that should be scanned and included in your uh, file upload. <clears throat> Sorry, okay. I'm assuming that everybody has a phone and can take a picture of a page and, and build it into a, a, a Word document or a Google Doc uh, and upload it that way. Yeah, Joseph, go ahead. Uh, could we use like MS Paint or something like that instead of uh, scanning a, taking a picture of a, a drawn picture? Uh, yes, you can use any any device that you wish to to make a, a diagram. Um, so you could build it in in uh, um, PowerPoint or or uh, Illustrator or whatever you'd like um, to or Excel um, to make a, to make a graph or something like that. So the point is not to test your graphic stability, um, but to be able to produce um, a useful correct diagrams with the uh, axes labeled and so forth. The exam uh, questions will specify what kind of formats and if, if uh, diagrams are required, um, you know, the components of the diagram will be specified in the question. Other concerns or questions about the exam or material that we've covered so far? Do the quizzes get opened back up to study the material? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear your question. Could you repeat it a little bit more loudly? Do the quizzes get opened back up to look at the material? The quizzes, um, I'm not sure if you can look at the quiz. Can you go back and look at the quizzes after they're closed? I'm not sure if you can or not. Um, I don't what think I've we been can. Doing, what I've been doing is just printing out the quizzes um, and studying them, uh, you know, I just print out after I've submitted my second one, I print them out and then I can study that way. That's what I've been doing, but. I okay. just checked and you can go back. Yeah, I also look. you can. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I just sort of a balance, you know, I, I'd rather that you know the answers and can answer them quickly. And, and you know, with uh, the number of questions that you have and the amount of time that you have, you know, it's really going to be a, you know, a challenge to know the answers instead of having to look things up. And the order of the answers will be different. The order of the questions will be different for every student. Um, and then Canvas, the Canvas quiz assignments allows me to, to cause the questions to be shuffled. Um, and so the idea there is to encourage students to work independently. You're required to work independently. And I'm um, assuming that everybody's on their honor to work independently on this. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess it would be possible to have a printout of everything, all the exams and be able to go up and look that out. But I think that, uh, you know, with the amount of time that's available, you know, that you're gonna be much better off if you rely on the knowledge that you've acquired by doing this these quizzes ahead of time. Yes, who else had questions? Um, I have a question, uh, Dr. Ahead. McDonald. So, well, I just went and checked. I went back to like reading quiz one. Yeah. So that one is not available for viewing. So I think you may have to like change some of the settings to make sure that we can see all of them. Cause I was gonna like use the quizzes to study, but it's not like I'm, I don't plan on like going back and like looking at them during the test of course, but I did want to use them to study, so. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's what I'll do. That, that, that's a good point. So I'll do that. Now you could print them out, you know, um, and there's nothing I can do about that. I, I, I'm not going to do honor lock because I, I just think there are too many technical problems with honor lock. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 so I'm going to sort of re rely on people to, you know, to be trying to measure their own progress here, but I will I will make sure that all the exams, Carrie and I will make sure that all the exams are available for view. And then I guess we'll close the exams, um, the quizzes um, before the, before the uh, class time exam starts. Is that clear? Thank you. Okay, great. Any other questions about the exam or material? So far. Will chapter seven be included? Chapter seven will not be included. The, the material on the exam is through what we've covered today. So chapters essentially one through six 
uh, are the topics of the um, of the uh, uh, multiple choice and true false questions. All right, excellent. Thank you. And then, but then the you know, so that's worth fifty percent of your grade is to be able to, you know, demonstrate that you're you know completely familiar with uh, the material that was covered by the reading quizzes that you've read and absorbed this and you know have acquired knowledge of facts. Um, part B is designed to test your ability to think, articulate, express, um, do original uh, research or original thinking synthesis. Um, and so that's an equally important uh, component of this. And so um, uh, this is not a sort of a um, you know, fact checking kind of exam. This is more of a, a thinking synthesis presentation uh, component. So you'll be graded on your ability to, to um, answer questions in you know, properly grammatic form um, and using diagrams and other uh, aids to, to make sure that your point is gotten across. Yes, Austin. So for part B, you mentioned that they're gonna be a lot like the weekly team questions we have, um, mm -hmm. but then you said we, you, it's not gonna be graded on research type of thing. So do you want us to do research for these part B questions or should they be independent thinking? Uh, I, well, it depends on the question. Um, some of the questions will require research or require citation so that you have to back up what you're saying with you know, sources. Okay, thank okay. you. All right. Once, All right. Once it started, Dr. McDonald, once it started, I mean, can we, you know, take breaks and go back and forth? Or once we start, we have to, you know, continue. It's, it's open for the entire period from eight to Correct. midnight. We can it's jump open. around and, you know, take an hour break here and there. Yes, it's open. Okay. Well, you, the, the exam questions will be made available at eight. And, you know, so you'll be able to look at them and, you know, you might print them out or whatever you want to do. And then you have until midnight to prepare your answers on, you know, for files for uploading and the uploading must be completed by midnight. Very well, sir. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, let's get ahead. I know. Um, so our activities for today, uh, we're going to continue. Um, oops, this is not the right question. Okay, sorry. Uh, misplaced a file here. All right, so uh, our activity today uh, is going to be to uh, continue our discussion of biomes and the way that biomes are impacted. Um, and I would like you to, you know, so we're gonna, um, I'm gonna try to keep my lecture remarks and my prepared remarks fairly brief, and then we're gonna break into um, a steady groups. Let me, I've, I'm sorry, I've lost a file, misplaced one. Uh, here. The one you had on prior to this um, was a list of the activity scheduled for the day. That was for the sixth. Um, no, it, was for, it said for the eighth on top. Right, but it. Um, okay. Yeah, all right. I'm sorry. I, um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're going to continue our discussion of extinction events, and we're going to answer the question um, in the form of graphic dissertation. We're going to compare the sixth extinction events in the, in the geologic past. Um, and, you know, very importantly, I want you to think about this concept of ecological services. This is what we discussed last week. And, um, you know, what are the major concerns about the widespread loss of biodiversity? And what I'd like you to do when we return is I'm gonna, you know, so each team should be preparing uh, um, uh, uh, text and answers uh, to questions uh, one through four. And when I call on teams, I'd like you to come back and have, you know, well-prepared answers for these questions. So I'm gonna give you um, quite a bit of time to, you know, to complete all this. And uh, then when we, when we uh, break it, come back from the breakout groups, um, I'd like the teams to make uh, presentations here. So, um, and I, and, you know, as we continue with the, the class, I'd like to have the teams um, 
develop more and more articulated and complete answers to the activities that, that, that are assigned for the breakout groups. Um, so when we come back, you know, make sure that you're able to answer each of these questions one through four, um, and to be able to answer them with uh, with citation or basis of you know sources, and also to um, engage in discussion about this material. Okay. Yes, Sammy, did you have a question? Sorry, I didn't. I don't know how I turned my video on. <laughs> That's okay, Sam. Not to worry. I thought, I thought you had a question there. All right. Uh -huh. So. So is that clear? All right. Well, let me uh, just continue with the, the, the remarks that I wanted to make today. My camera up a little bit further. And so um, we started talking about the distribution of terrestrial biomes. Now, I'm, I'm limiting the discussion that I'm presenting today about terrestrial biomes. And later in the course, I'll be talking about marine biomes and the marine environment. Because the, you know, you look at this kind of a picture of the earth and you see, you know, these, this distribution of, you know, where organisms, where biomes occur. And, you know, two thirds of the earth's surface is left out of this picture. Um, and so there are marine biomes and they have uh, different characteristics, but I'm going to, in my remarks, I'm going to uh, you know, cover that material uh, in later lectures. So, you know, the question that the book raises is this, these uh, biomes as they're presently configured. And of course, the, you know, the, the boundaries between different biome types that are drawn on this map are drawn as distinct lines. But in reality, these boundaries are fuzzy. Um, there, you know, you wouldn't be able to cross from, you know, uh, savanna to desert, uh, you know, across an actual line uh, in the sand or a line across the, the earth. This is a, you know, there's a gradient that separates each of these. And that gradient is determined, uh, as we noted, by um, uh, uh, average temperature, average precipitation, uh, and the, uh, the characteristics of the, the, the substrate, the, um, the physical characteristics of the continental uh, material um, across which the biomes are distributed. And so this, you know, this uh, concept of how biomes are distributed, and then, um, you know, there's also a latitude. So there's a ge ge geographic differences in where biomes are, and there is an in latitudinal difference. By latitudinal difference, I mean as you go further north or further south uh, from the equator, you get changes and characteristic changes in uh, 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 rainfall and temperature, and these characteristics are going to produce the biomes. So the characteristics in um, you know the the uh, latitudinal uh, positioning of biomes are affected, you know, determine what kind of uh, plants and animal communities are possible. The other component of this are, you know, rainfall and precipitation uh, characteristics. And so uh, we know, for example, that, um, you know, that rainfall amounts and rainfall characteristics are different uh, as we proceed from the coastal regions inland and um, so that there are uh, changes that are longitudinal rather than latitudinal in effect. All right, so having you know, uh, thought about this, you know, how does this translate in terms of you know, how the human beings are impacting this environment or these, these biomes? And this is a question posed by the book, how is climate change affecting this? Um, but climate change is a sort of a narrow range of topics. So climate change is, you know, concerns the, you know, the change in climate, in rainfall, precipitation, temperature. Um, but there are also other changes that are induced by the way in which human beings interact with their environment. So if we think about humanity, you know, natural organisms utilize energy metabo metabolically by converting external energy, sunlight, chemical energy into cellular processes, um, and by uh, making organic material or consuming an organic material as, as food. And uh, plants and animals do harvest physical energy. The winds uh, spread seeds, water currents uh, alter soil, uh, animals swim with uh, water. However, human beings are absolutely unique among any species that's ever existed in that they are able to control uh, combustion. They are able to generate energy. 
And uh, this is uh, referred to as a Promethean gift. And Prometheus, of course, was the uh, Greek demigod who uh, descended from Olympus and gave human beings uh, the gift of fire and was punished by the gods from that by uh, being uh, you know, I think this, uh, tethered to a mountainside with eagles eating his liver. Um, so, um, you know, that punishment is sort of a, a measure for how this uh, ability of human beings to alter the environment uh, has a huge impact. Um, so this, this ability to control combustion, which is, you know, probably been part of the human species uh, since they uh, first evolved, um, uh, it really con constrains or really affects what the impact that this species has uh, on uh, ecosystems and biomes across the planet. And um, in addition, many organisms do transfer the physical and biochemical environment in which they live. And it's you know, many, many examples of this. Um, you know, for example, beavers uh, uh, alter the, uh, the hydrology of uh, 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 forest ecosystems, grassland ecosystems, and so forth. Uh, we heard in the program about wolves, how you know, wolves are actually able to alter the course of rivers through their uh, secondary effects of how they uh, manipulate the, the environment, and change the, the behavior of prey animals, uh, reef building corals uh, and other uh, marine organisms have uh, caused the deposition of massive amounts of, of calcium carbonate uh, in the form of um, uh, coral reefs or in the form of shell material Material, which accumulates over geologic time. Earthworms alter the uh, hydrologic and uh, chemical characteristics of soil. So there are many, many organisms which do uh, impact uh, the, the physical and biochemical environment. However, human beings do so at a scale and a pace which is absolutely impressive, unprecedented. And examples of the way in which human beings are altering, altering the natural world include the, the use of fresh water and the ability of human beings to divert fresh water and uh, use it for crops, to uh, use uh, fossil fresh water from aquifers uh, to grow crops in areas that wouldn't normally uh, be able to, to support uh, you know, that kind of uh, plant growth. They also uh, participate in deforestation and uh, radically alter the composition of the atmosphere. So let's look a little bit more closely at how these uh, changes play out um, within the global ecosystem. So taking the question of, of fresh water, um, you know, it, you know, just in the United States, the growth of U.S. dams and reservoirs has been really dramatic. And uh, what this is showing you in this diagram here is, you know, how um, human activity has <clears throat> led to the impoundment of, uh, of water that would otherwise, you know, flow across the landscape and uh, you know, eventually run out into the ocean or make its way via groundwater into aquifers. And uh, over time, you can see that there's been a, just a tremendous growth in uh, this sort of impoundment. Uh, so dams and reservoirs have dramatically changed the freshwater utilization. Uh, not shown in here is the use of, um, of uh, 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 pumping of water from aquifers. And so uh, much of the uh, American West uh, has um, uh, been converted to uh, agricultural use. And that ag those agricultural ecosystems are supported by fresh water, which would normally not be supplied by the natural climatic systems. But this water is taken from aquifers, and these aquifers are filled up during the uh, uh, last ice age after the ice melted. Uh, a, a significant portion of that fresh water ended up in you know, large fossil, fossil water deposits uh, deep underground. And these uh, freshwater de deposits have been depleted um, over time uh, much more rapidly than, than they, they are being refilled. And so there's been a depletion of, uh, of fresh water. Also, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the conditions of the ocean are becoming uh, much more acidic as a result of um, carbon dioxide absorbed from the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide, when it uh, is dissolved in seawater, dissociates and forms a weak acid. And so adding uh, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide to the oceans uh, changes the pH, reduces the, um, the pH of, uh, of uh, oceanic waters. Um, and uh, uh, 
um, with the effect that it becomes more acidic. With this acidification of the oceans, we have, uh, we can create, uh, the environment creates a, a, a very strong stresses on organisms that are dependent on forming calcium carbonate shells and um, other tissues. So uh, corals, um, which uh, have to form um, calcium carbonate uh, reef structures, have to work harder uh, to precipitate these, these uh, materials, these minerals, under conditions of in increased acidity. And so this uh, graph is showing us how the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, from a sort of a baseline of about 280 parts per a million uh, to the present day. We're not quite at 450 parts per million, but we're rapidly approaching this level. And uh, you can see that you know, from this diagram that the um, uh, aragonite saturation state, which is a measure of, of the acidity of the ocean, uh, is increasing um, uh, significantly across large portions of the ocean. So the oceans are being affected by um, uh, human activities. And you know we can't see a lot of these changes that we've made to the atmosphere, but we can measure, as you saw with the uh, uh, calcium carbon with the aragonate saturation state, we can measure their effects in long-term changes in the, um, uh, in the state of various um, uh, the oceans in the atmosphere. So um, this graph here is you know, going back in time. This is a logarithmic time scale. So we go back um, to you know, something like 10,000 years ago. And um, you know, over this time scale, you know, we can see that, uh, that you know, the Earth's uh, characteristics have been regular, re relatively constant. Um, and so this is the atmospheric CO2 concentration. And then as the human population really started to explode, um, you know, in the mid 18th century with the industrial revolution, the um, uh, human population and the uh, atmospheric uh, uh, concentrations of CO2 have skyrocketed, have been increased at a exponential rate. And so there's a direct correlation between the growth of the human population and the um, uh, increase in the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere. That increase in the carbon dioxide content um, is affecting not just global warming, but um, the uh, uh, ocean and her atmospheric biomes. And so, um, and other factors uh, are present here. We've, a lot of attention is fo focused on CO2 um, because of its um, effect on uh, uh, greenhouse gases, but there are other com important components of the atmosphere that have equal changes. So ozone depletion, changing the amount of ozone, reducing the amount of ozone uh, in the upper atmosphere. Uh, this was a, a major issue. Um, this uh, changes the uh, ability of the atmosphere to block UV radiation. And so it has a direct impact on um, human health, but also the health of uh, the organisms. Uh, nitrous oxide increasing in the atmosphere. It's another greenhouse gas. Uh, atmospheric uh, methane. Methane is also a very powerful greenhouse gas. So um, these factors in the atmosphere are all changing over time as a direct result of human population growth. And these changes you know, collectively are um, causing changes in the, well, associated with the, um, these changes here are the ways in which human beings have converted the landscape into ecosystems that help support humanity. So, um, and this is an interesting uh, diagram because it's showing us, you know, how, um, you know, the intensity and the, the duration of human impact in the environment here. So if you look at in years of intensive use, um, so this is a measure of how long the human population has been transforming the uh, ecosystem. So, um, you know, in some regions where humans have existed for a long time, we can see that there are, um, you know, that the, that the, the biomes and the uh, physical environment uh, has been impacted, uh, you know, for, for, for many, uh, many centuries. And, um, this is sort of all expressed in terms of landscape changes. 
And so uh, you know, human, do, you know, one measure of this is erosion. I know how the land physically is being removed, uh, changed. Um, and so uh, human induced erosion um, is, uh, you know, is, um, and this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, so we can see that human induced uh, er erosion is, um, you know, sort of uh, plateaued at this very high level. And this represents a market increase from historic levels. And whereas the natural mean rate of, of, uh, of erosion, the water uh, land being washed into the oceans has been relatively steady. Um, human uh, 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 landscape changes have resulted in much more rapid rates of e e erosion. And this has a direct impact on the productivity of agricultural land, pasture land. And so, um, you know, we are not in a sustainable condition in terms of being able to maintain the, um, the, the biome for human uh, use. So, um, you know, we can break this down into a number of different sort of impacts. Humans have boosted the numbers of useful useful for human beings, species such as cattle, while depleting the others. So um, through hunting, overfishing, habitat loss, invasive competition, very important. Um, and uh, you know, many scientists believe that human beings will cause the planet's sixth mass extinction. And this is the, the um, uh, material that was covered in the Colbert article. Um, the Colbert article focused on uh, uh, amphibians and, and bats, um, but many uh, species of marine organisms are also very heavily depleted. And the oceans uh, just over the last uh, uh, you know, generation or so, you know, have seen a, a major, major impact in terms of the uh, you know, removal of, of fish species, particularly the removal of the large predatory fish uh, with a shift toward, um, uh, you know, it, it sort of shifted the, the trophic balance within the oceans uh, to a, a, a different level. So, um, you know, the percentage of worldwide fisheries that are fully exploited um, has increased. And so essentially all of the fisheries, um, you know, as of 2000, so this, this graph has continued on through the present. Uh, there are very few uh, fisheries which are, um, and have uh, room for further expansion. And you can see this also reflected in the, um, the number of species which exist. So this species abundance, um, you know, starting at a 100% baseline, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, gone down over the last uh, 30 years or so. And, um, you know, uh, 90% of the total mammalian biomass on the planet is made up of human beings and domesticated animals. And that's up from 0.1% um, you know, uh, 10,000 years ago. So this, this graph here on the, on the uh, right-hand side of the, of the slide here you know, really tells a very graphic story in terms of how human beings have altered the planet during this Holocene and why it is that the Holocene, the sort of the uh, geologic era, I know that uh, uh, we would normally have been in, has been transformed into the Anthropocene by um, uh, human uh, shifts towards domesticated organisms and towards agricultural ecosystems. Um, we can look at the effects of climate change. Here's another study, and I said that. Um, uh, we, you know, as the planet warms and as the rainfall and uh, other patterns change, we can expect to see that there's a, a migration of biomes from the lower latitudes towards the higher latitudes. In other words, the, the uh, areas are expanding generally. And so what this um, diagram is showing here, this is sort of saying, um, you know, what would we predict from um, changes in temperature over time. So this baseline here is what we would predict. And um, then this uh, collection of measurements here where they're measuring different species shows what's actually been observed or has happened. So you know, with the change in temperature that you know, is measurable, 
uh, we would expect that this would have some has an effect on where plants and animals can live. And if we just look at the abundance of uh, different groups, so the open triangles are um, mammals, the solid circles are anthro anthropods and beetles and insects, the solid um, inverted triangles are plants, so the plants are um, here, and um, solid, uh, so the other organisms are, are, are present here. Um, and uh, you know, this change in um, uh, distribution according to, um, so and this, this is comparing, so this is the observed latitudinal shifts of different uh, plant and animal groups. Um, and this is not reflected. So there's a sort of a trend, an increasing trend um, of, uh, of you know, where, the, where plants and animals are able to live. So what this means essentially is that plant and animal communities are migrating northward out of their, or southward out of their um, traditional range. And, and so that's what we see. This is sort of the climate based change. We don't see anything similar in terms of the uh, elevation uh, shifts. So the, um, you know, as we saw in that diagram uh, that I showed at the beginning, you know, increasing elevation sort of replicates the changes that we would see in, with, uh, with uh, increasing latitude. Um, so we're not seeing these, these same sorts of changes reflected in increasing elevation. So the elevation impacts on the distribution of organisms is, is not changing, whereas the latitudinal impact on the distribution of, uh, of organisms and the, the kinds of biomes that these organisms comprise uh, is changing. So this is a very graphic depiction of how um, uh, uh, climate change is impacting globally the distribution of plants and animals. All right, one final graph, and this comes, point, points a question, well, all right, here's another group. So these are um, uh, range boundaries of four uh, taxonomic groups uh, studied over Britain. And so um, generally speaking, there's a, a shift in latitude. All right, last slide here. So, um, you know, uh, this really gets to the carrying capacity of earth for the human population. And um, so, you know, we, we think about, you know, human population and how we should, uh, you know, try to alter the earth to make it more equitable for all species. And, um, um, you know, we know that improving the standard of living in poor countries by traditional means may negate the benefits of controlling population growth. Why would that be? Earth's maximum sustainable human population cannot be calculated without making value judgments about the quality of life that we desire. In other words, um, you know, we can, the, the planet currently holds about seven and a half billion people. It's probably going to break nine billion in the next uh, couple of decades. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of the numbers of people, um, the Earth has not yet reached its carrying capacity. But in terms of the quality of life uh, that these people are able to enjoy, and more importantly, the sustainability of that quality of life, um, you know, it's not directly related. And, you know, we have to ask, you know, in this shifting set of biomes and shifting set of sustainability, to what degree do earth populations or societies compete for resources? Okay, so that's uh, some remarks that, you know, intended to give a uh, different perspective or slightly expand material covered in the books. And so I'm now going to open up the uh, break rooms and I'd like you all to um, regroup and um, you know, uh, consider these uh, following questions. So compare the sixth extinction to events in the geologic past. In other words, look backward uh, in time and see um, you know, how our present uh, uh, extinction event, if in fact this is what's happening, compares with uh, other events. For example, the KT boundary event or the, com the comet impact that wiped out the, the dinosaurs. How is it different from cause and potential impact? I'd like you to figure out what the red list of endangered species are and uh, be prepared to um, make a presentation of how this is changing. 
And finally, you know, to synthesize this material, uh, go back and remember the concept of ecological services that we discussed uh, during last week's lectures. And so, um, you know, we, we, we're faced with this reality of declining biodiversity, shifting biomes, um, you know, decreased diversity. What are the concerns about this? You know, should we all be happy if, if uh, the earth is completely converted into a, an ecosystem which supports the human beings, the domesticated plants and domesticated animals? Uh, or is there some intrinsic value and some existence value which is maintained uh, if this natural ecosystems uh, continue to exist? And finally, you know, uh, we have to consider how if we are to change our way, or if, if it's important to change the way in which we're impacting the planet, uh, that has to be done by changing human behavior and human values. And um, so if, if we conclude that uh, biodiversity is an, you know, has an important impact on the ecological services on which human beings depend, how should we educate people so that they care about maintaining this biodiversity? And uh, in the developed world, in the United States, uh, we think a lot about uh, protecting species. So tigers and polar bears, uh, pandas, these are the um, uh, sort of poster children of uh, protecting biodiversity, and friends of the earth, that sort of thing. But other groups are much more obscure, beetles, small fishes. You know, uh, how do you make an argument that uh, suggests that we, you know, we should try to preserve these species. Um, so, you know, what is the sort of endangered species approach or endangered species act approach to preserving biodiversity? All right, I'm going to open the, um, the. I'll leave this screen up. I'm going to open up the um, the um, breakout rooms, and you'll be able to. So, I'll stop sharing here. And I'll open breakout rooms, and I'll ask you to join together. And then I'll uh, we'll we'll give you about 30, 25 minutes uh, to formulate answers to these questions. And then when we come back, I'll be calling on uh, two or three teams uh, to answer questions one through four. Okay, Carolina. I'm in the Planeteers. Planeteers. Terry O'Reilly, you're going to own the clams. Darren, you go to um, Aquatic Junkies, right? Yes, sir. And Dalia, you go to Planeteers, right? Dalia? All right, I'm not hearing from Dalia. Emily, where do you want to go? Um, the Wayfinders. Wayfinders. Kate. Team title. Team title. Penelope, what uh, group do you belong with? Penelope. Aquatic Junkies. Aquatic Junkies. And Whitney, you go to Big Green Machine? Yes. Dalia? Yeah, Planet hi. Planeteers. Planeteers. Thanks, Dalia. Hello, Beaches. You, professor. You clear on your assignment? Do you have an idea here what to do? Mm -hmm. So 
as I said, when you come back, I'm going to ask for probably more um, organized and structured responses to the questions than, than we've had in the past. Okay, so make sure you're able to, you know, show some bullet points or a graph or something like that uh, in response and come up with a you know, something that will uh, promote discussion because we we'd like to have a discussion about this. Okay. Absolutely. All right. I'll go check on somebody else now. <laughs> But, you know, mm. hey, Professor. Um, so I have a question. Okay. I was wondering if, you know, this being issues of um, science and stuff, if at any point we could discuss the political climate and debates and just kind of like, just do like the climate aspect of it and like kind of like give a briefing on everyone, just so that like we have the tools that when we are having these conversations with our friends and family, that we have, you know, the right info and stuff. And certainly you can do that. And, and you could incorporate that kind of thinking into your responses to the questions. So, you know, there's sort of, you know, and it was pretty, I don't know if how many people watched the debate last night, but it was in pretty stark contrast, you know, the two approaches here, one sort of saying that, uh, you know, forest management was what was needed in California and, and, you know, somebody else, the other side pointing out something very different. So you could take that example and say, okay, we have these two choices here. You know, what are the consequences of pursuing, pursuing one or the other? Mm -hmm. And, you know, another question, and maybe this is not exactly the right time for this, but um, one thing I do like to do is to say, you know, what is the the strongest pieces of evidence for climate change and for the impact of climate change. Um, because, you know, a lot of it, a lot of times the data or the, you know, the issues get sort of, get sort of you know, swept aside by people who are skeptical about the impact of climate change and then say, well, it's just a natural cycle or really, you know, this is all, you know, the fires in the West are all because of, uh, you know, uh, forest the management issues or you know it's it's not really getting hot it's just the effect of increased urban area that sort of thing you know what are the the best arguments what are the strongest and most um, effective arguments um, so we can you know we can begin to discuss that if you'll incorporate that into your into your responses there but okay. you know I do think that that's an important an important issue and I, I do hope that you know students leave this class you know uh, equipped to make, you know, cogent, powerful arguments in terms of the point of view that they develop about the natural world and about um, environmental science. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just thought it'd be fun to make like an exercise, you know, where people are like, oh, but what about this? And then you got to respond and then like. No, that's a great of... idea. Maybe I will do that in, you know, one of the, well, we're certainly going to be getting into climate change. That's a whole chapter on that. And so I've, I've tried to build this into the, you know, the assignments and the thinking sort of building up to it, you know, giving us different ideas like ecological services, for example, you know, what happens to the ecosystem that we depend on when we start removing these ecological services and can't depend on, you know, dunes, for example, to protect um, the coastline or, um, uh, you know, insects to pollinate our plants that, and, you know, that, that, those kinds of questions. Cool, sounds good. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go check on other folks. Make sure that you have arguments that are well-founded and you know, bullet points and sources to back up your discussion when we get back together, okay? Okay. Hello, Aquatic Junkies, how are you doing? Good. Okay, so, um, you know, like I said, when we, I'm not sure if I'll call on you or not, because that's a, you know, that's a, uh, there's a choosing, uh, you know, a, a spinning wheel that determines uh, who's going to get called on. But, you know, make sure that you prepare your responses to the, you know, to the questions there in a, in a more organized way so that you can present, you know, facts and, you know, and data uh, to back up these ideas that you want to talk about. Okay. Yes, sir. Any questions about what you're doing or suggestions about how to make this more effective? Or I should just let you get on with your work here. 
Thank you, sir. All right. Hi, uh, Rosangela, are you, do you need to be assigned somewhere? Yes, sorry, I was completely late. So I was just trying to see if I could join my group right now. Where do you need to go? I'm sorry. Oh, Wayfinders. Wayfinders, here you go, putting you in there now. Thank you. Hello, homeboys, how are you doing? Good. 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 Okay. So um, when we get back together, uh, I, you know, I'm going to be calling on different teams to respond to the prompts and make sure that you have some, you know, bullet points or text or something that you can share, you know, to really make your, your response more structured than just sort of winging it with a few, a few comments. Okay. So you might want to, you know, bring in some, you know, some material that you've written out or take stuff from your essay uh, responses and be ready to talk about that, okay? Any questions about what you're supposed to be doing? All right, I'll let you get on with it then. Check to licks. Are you all here? I'm not seeing anyone. Yes, sir. We're here. We're all just kind of working on the document. All right, you're working on a document, so you understand. Try to be a little more structured and be prepared to, you know, make uh, uh, points and arguments that we can discuss as a as a team you know, when we get as a group when we get back together. Okay. Yes, sir. Any questions? Um, I think so. All right, we're I'll let you get on with your work then. I've been taking like policy classes. Um, I've taken a ton of like Marcus Hutel classes just cause like I loved his marine pollution class. That was my favorite class of his that I've ever taken. I, I wanna do that. Mm -hmm. Hello, team title. Hello. Doing okay, you ready to present some structured answers to the questions there when we get back together? All right, have you been thinking about this? If you have, you know, you have any sort of, is this, you know, are we succeeding in sort of building, uh, uh, you know, concepts that help us think about environmental science uh, in the course of this? Well, that's the idea is that we sort of gradually increase our, our knowledge base and, and the intellectual tools that we have to both think about this and also to convince others. Um, and, you know, I'm hoping that students that have taken this class are able to go out and make, uh, you know, powerful, compelling arguments, um, you know, both in conversation and, you know, maybe even in writing and, you know, uh, community uh, presentations that, you know, will speak to your opinions and speak to your concerns about the environment in a way that convinces others. And so hopefully that's what's happening and we get a chance to practice this, um, you know, in within our safe environment of our class here where everybody respects everybody else. Yeah, um, we, we actually started it on Tuesday because we got finished with the first one. So I, we got good answers. Great, all right, well, that's what I like to hear. All right, well, I'm gonna let you get on with it and check on everybody else then. Thanks. Oh, you're muted. So sometimes I'm coming in, sometimes I'm muted when I come into these groups and sometimes I'm unmuted. I can't really tell. <laughs> so cabbages, are you doing well? Are you got this figured out? You're going to be able to, I've been telling everybody, you know, that we're trying to build up a sort of a, you know, a knowledge base and then also a, you know, practice in communication so that when you finish this class, you can go to other classes or to the community or your friends or your family and be able to make you know, succinct, you know, well-supported, 
um, compelling arguments about how you feel about the environment and you know environmental science. And so that's the you know that's the agenda that I have um, you know for the for the class here. And I hope that's what's what's happening, and that I hope that we have a chance to sort of practice those skills um, in this safe environment of the of the uh, class. All right. So you feel like you're understand what's asked of and, and you'll be able to come back in about five, 10 minutes or so and, and, and do that. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes. All righty. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Planeteers. Are you here? Are you uh, working productively? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, participating in this way, you know, sort of formulating arguments, coming back and presenting these arguments or ideas in a, in a format where people are listening to you and listening critically about what you have to say, discussing it. You know, these are skills that hopefully you'll be able to carry forward um, when you finish the class, and then you'll be able to go out in the world to your other, uh, you know, classroom work that you do, and to your community and family, and be able to make uh, compelling uh, science-based arguments about, you know, the questions that are facing um, uh, our society as we deal with major environmental challenges. And hopefully, that's that's a, you know a skill set that's being improved. Um, by the work that we're doing in the class here. So you understand that when we get to back together in another few minutes, the teams that are called on are gonna to need to make, you know, more structured arguments and more structured presentations than they've done in the past. Is that clear to everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. So any questions about what you're doing? Um, no, I think we're all good. Okay. I'll let you get back to it. And yes, there's something. Yes. Um, so with the questions that are like we had for today specifically, yeah. um, we use any sources to, to answer those, correct? Yes. Okay. So like if we use our, the book, like we're allowed to do that. You certainly are. You're allowed to do the, you know, uh, it, hopefully you'll use not, not just the book, but you'll use the book as a foundation um, for you know, looking into that. And that's what I try to do in my lectures. You know, we've got this foundation of material that we cover with our reading and we, you know, we learn about it. We measure our skills um, through the uh, team essays and the individual reading quizzes. But then we build on that with you know, more specific uh, uh, material from the peer reviewed literature or like the, uh, the article that we read about the sixth extinction. Um, so that sort of fleshes out and expands the basic material that's covered in the chapters. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, uh, a few more minutes. I'm gonna bail out right now. Yeah. So, green machines, are you uh, making progress? You ready to get back together? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions about what you're supposed to be doing? You're ready with arguments and discussion points? All right. Okay. So, uh, all right. Well, I'm going to leave the room here and I'm going to be closing the discussion, the breakout rooms in about a minute or so. And then we'll get back together and have our, our class discussion for the next uh, 15 minutes or people want to hang around for the next 30 minutes. Thank you.
You're muted, sir. You're muted. I, I got it. Sometimes it mutes me and I don't know. All right, so we're back together now, and uh, we're going to be talking uh, about the uh, four different questions that were posted for your um, consideration in your breakout groups. And I'll be calling on uh, team, individual teams. I have a list of the teams that I've called on so far. Uh, so Green Machine, Can't Fathom, Wayfinders, and Beach Please have already been called on, uh, but every other team is, uh, is uh, uh, you know, should be prepared for discussion. So the first question that we wanted to talk about is this idea of comparing the sixth extinction events, um, the sixth extinction, the present day sixth extinction as described by uh, Elizabeth Colbert in that New Yorker article, which we all read. I'd like you to compare that to um, extinction events in the past. Uh, for example, the, the cometary impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. How is what's happening today different um, uh, in, in scale and in um, effect? All right, so spinning the wheel here. And the first question goes to the home buoys. All right, home buoys. Uh, so home buoys, please go ahead and um, uh, activate your screens and you have uh, five minutes to answer this, uh, this question. So um, the first thing that I wanna say about um, <clears throat> how the sixth extinction is different to any other of the past five extinctions um, is that the sixth extinction is mainly caused by humans rather than driven by natural factors like the past five extinctions were. Um, and some of the causes of it are transformation of landscape, overexploitation of species and resources and pollution, amongst others. And to that, we can also add the factor of um, the human population growing so much that Earth is reaching its carrying capacity, just like any ecosystem would if a species grew at the rate at which humans are growing. Um, so that is how it differs a little bit of other extinctions, because, for example, um, when the fifth major extinction happened, um, which is when the meteorite hit the Earth, right? that was a physical factor that affected life on earth. So a big event happened and then all of other life after that was altered because of this big event. However, the sixth extinction has been an accumulation of malpractice spe specifically caused by humans and actions like I mentioned earlier, like pollution or over exploitation of resources or uh, just changing the, um, changing ecosystems for our benefit. So building cities or putting agriculture and deforestation for agriculture and stuff like that. So um, I think that is the main difference in between them. Um, however, when it comes to the impact, um, it's a little bit more similar to the others because it's just at the end of the day, a mass extension, which means loss of species and loss of biodiversity, which will result in altering biomes and ecosystems and how we function. Okay, um, any, anybody in the class want to comment on that or anybody else in the team want to expand on what uh, Berta was telling us? Um, I do want to say that um, she is right about that you know hu obviously human has caused this um exploit like this extinction but if you look at past extinctions and you actually look at like co2 levels within extinctions you can see the rise and fall which would like cause these extinctions from like natural causes like a volcano eruption or uh, the famous meteor in the K uh, kyt boundary um so it's kind of it still correl correlates to co2 and the temperature and the overall temperature within the ecosystem but as of now the rate as which that temperature is increasing is the problem which is where climate change you know and climate scientists are fighting for right now so that's all I have a similarity to say about the uh, extinction events. Um, so one thing that's true with all extinction events is the rules sort of change. Like um, I think in the article we read, Darwin was saying 
that like um, species can usually evolve and adapt sort of the similar um, rates that the environment does. But like, uh, I'll talk about the last one, it's the most famous one, but like when the meteorite struck the earth, it got super cold really quickly. So a bunch of species that were fit to fill their, um, their niches in their environment couldn't uh, compete anymore and um, they all died out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the KT boundary event, you know, it's, it's, it was this sudden impact. So it was literally, you know, hours. And there's a article maybe I'll assign or make available, you know, where they've actually, some of the recent ge the paleontological evidence, um, you know, there was a, a guy working in Montana, I believe, who found fossil deposits. And in these fossil deposits, this was a lake bed. And he could see that animals had been killed abruptly and buried in, um, you know, mud, uh, and, you know, fishes washed up and buried in layers. And it, you know, he concluded that he'd found fossil evidence that preserved the actual moment of the, you know, when the impact of the, of the uh, 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 comet reached Montana, you know, because there was an impact, there was a, a, an earthquake, and then there were huge uh, tsunamis and, um, uh, you know, water was displaced. And so they can actually see that moment in time, you know, a, literally a matter of hours and days in which the extinction of the planet changed from one state to another. So, um, you know, we're, we're living through a more gradual uh, rate of change, um, but it is, um, you know, uh, and it's, you know, it's different in the sense, but we really are altering, you know, the planet in, in ways that are just as fundamental. All right, well, let's move on uh, to the next question. What is the red list of endangered species and how does that help us to understand um, you know, what should be, uh, you know, how, what kind of species are in danger and what kind of uh, preservation are needed. So I'm spinning the wheel, it's the homeboys. And the next group on tap is Can't Fathom. All right, Can't Fathom, please activate your cameras and tell us about the red list. Can't fathom. Hello, can't Just fathom. Just give me one second. Okay. So, so the red list comes from the IUCN, which is the International U Union for Conservation of Nature. And it's basically a list of endangered species that are classified, um, that classify plants, animals, and other organisms that are just threatened by extinction. Um, for its importance, it's not only an indicator of the health and the, of the environment and the level of biodiversity on the planet, but also a good way to analyze and um, um, is a tool to boost like conservative efforts in protecting natural resources. Okay, great. Anybody in your team want to add to that? Or, you know, how is that, uh, you know, is that related to the Endangered Species Act? Are all of the animals on the Endangered Species Act also on the red list? Anybody know about that? So, you know, we have uh, animals that are classified as endangered or threatened in, you know, uh, uh, under the protection that's afforded by the uh, Endangered Species Act, the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Is that the same or different from the red list, do you think? I have something to add about that. Sorry. Um, yeah, this is my question. So the uh, the IUCN uh, red list is like an ongoing project and it doesn't only cover endangered and threatened species, it looks at everything and just gives an assessment on them. And I think it's a relatively new thing because um, they only have 120,000 species on there and I think they had a goal of 160,000 by the end of the year. Um, but just because a species is not on the red list does not mean that it is not threatened or endangered, it just means it hasn't been assessed yet. Okay, well, good point, good point. Thank you, Joseph. Anybody else want to comment on the red list? We'll move on to the next question. We've got another few minutes left. Okay, all right, I'm gonna ask now the question of, um, based on the, con the concept of ecological services, what are the major concerns about the loss of biodiversity on the planet? All right, spinning the wheel.
and stopping at um, team title. All right, team title. Please activate your screen and tell us about the um, major concerns about ecological services. I think you might be muted, Alexander. Yes, I am, sorry. Um, which question is this? This is three. Uh, based on the concept of ecological services, what are the major concerns about the widespread loss of biodiversity as measured by the red list or uh, sixth extinction kinds of concepts? Okay, give me one second to pull it up. So um, we have just some examples and from one article from National Geographic in 2019, it showed that humans have caused 40% of amphibians. Okay, I'm totally reading the wrong one. I'm so sorry. Okay. That was uh, from Tuesdays. Okay. Um, so loss of biodiversity is a huge threat to um, healthy ecosystems. And as more species become extinct, food chains can be disrupted and therefore affect more species. Um, and it's, it creates a, an essentially a positive feedback loop um as more species get threatened it then enables other species to be threatened as well how does that work um so for example if um it, it has to do with food chains so if there's a food chain where um let's say frogs eat crickets and a species of crickets disappear that then puts the frogs at a greater risk because they have to search for more food and if it actually ends up that more species are endangered and then threatened it can it can destroy whole food chains through that effect um, and that's why it's a really big deal because it's not just one species like it, it is a big deal when we lose one species but it's concerning because it can have widespread effects on other species around it Okay, well, opening the question up to the entire class, we had a graphic example of how removal of one species had a tremendous impact on a large scale ecosystem. And that when that species was reintroduced, the ecosystem you know, reverted to a more stable and biodiverse uh, area. Can, you, can anybody recall what that example was? And you know, how does that help you think about you know, extinction or removal of species and how that would affect a, an ecosystem. Yellowstone. Yellowstone, and what was the, how did that example work? Can you, you know, briefly recapitulate what, uh, what they said in that, uh, in that, you know, really interesting article about uh, wolves in Yellowstone? So like the removal of the wolves basically made it so that like other animals didn't have as much, like they didn't have the pressures that they needed to have. So it allowed them to like grow out of hand and like maximize their populations to a point that wasn't sustainable. And so the removal of like certain species that um, have influences on other species will um, ultimately like affect all the species that that one influences. Right, so the wolves were, you know, controlling the population of elk and deer, ungulates that browse the, the vegetation. And the removal of wolves meant that the population of elk and deer, uh, you know, grew out of control and they were not limited by wolves, they were limited by the availability of food. The reintroduction of wolves changed the behavior, not just of those uh, species, those prey species, but all of the related ecosystem effects. Um, so, you know, keep in mind that when we look at these kinds of questions and when you're answering uh, essays, for example, on the, uh, the, the exam, you know, we've already presented different ideas and different concepts that will help to answer these questions. All right, we've got a, just a second or two left. I wanna call on, you know, one more team to answer um, question four. Answer question four was, um, you know, what are some ways that we could educate the, species, the public about the value of biodiversity? So the team that should answer that is the Wayfinders. All right, Wayfinders. No, I'm sorry, Wayfinders is exempt. Bad Beaches is on, on um, 
tap. All right, bad beaches. Can you please activate and quickly answer the question of how we should educate the public? Yeah, hi. So we talked about um, the importance of understanding like trophic levels and how species are interconnected because we felt like if people or the general public understood how smaller, more obscure species connected to the larger, more well-known species, um, it would help people understand why conservation of those species are so important. So the example that we talked about was frogs because um, we felt like a lot of people don't really care about them because they're kind of weird looking and small and just not really well known. And we kind of traced through their diet and talked about how they can help control insect populations or as tadpoles eat algae, which can help um, control algae population. And educating about these things could help people understand why their conservation is so important. Um, and then a specific example was maybe a cartoon or a children's book would be kind of a cute way to do this. Um, but there's obviously a lot of other ways that you could educate about these things. Okay. So you think that this kind of education could work well at sort of a, you know, K through 12 or, you know, pre, you know, like young people kind of yeah. a, out yeah. audience? Well, we thought, cause <laughs> we brought up, we brought up the deep, uh, we brought up the deep sea and um, it's just not cared about because a lot of people just don't understand it or it's not studied enough or it's seemed as like ugly too, like the creatures that are down there. And so as you brought up like discussing polar bears and discussing, you know, we only save what is cute. We only save what is cute. We thought maybe that would be a great idea to start like a children's book or to put it into a frame, a frame of media where it could be, you know, seemed as a little bit more approachable and cute and stuff like that. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. I like a lot of this education has to start at a, you know, at a young level. And, you know, uh, I guess, I don't know, maybe, maybe have, people have more experience in, um, you know, uh, education in a sort of primary grades than I do. Um, but it does seem to me that, you know, children are naturally interested in plants and animals, and that there's a chance to sort of expand their thinking about you know, the value of these plants and animals beyond just like, oh, I think, you know, tigers are cute or, you know, pandas are cute, but, you know, maybe think that, like you say, frogs are cute or deep sea fish are, are interesting. And so perhaps it's possible to do that. All right, well, thanks. I guess we have a few, we've gone over time, but, um, you know, people who want to hang around for another few minutes and discuss here, um, you know, we, we had a, a debate last night and uh, during the debate, the question of climate change. I don't know how many people watched the debate, but um, um, you know, the question of climate change came up, and there were two very sort of different answers that were given to this. And I wonder, you know, uh, thinking about that and thinking about the sort of uh, choices that society and the American electorate face, you know, how would questions about biodiversity and these sorts of things uh, impact political discussion? I don't know if anybody wants to, to comment on that. Okay, well, I watched the debate, and I guess I can say my personal opinion, but um, of course you can, and, and I that's think it's respected by everybody. That's understood. Yeah. Well, actually, first of all, I was disappointed by both candidates. Um, I think, well, Pence just said that science can determine it. He didn't even say that it's man-made, whatever. But I was also kind of disappointed that um, Kamala Harris defended fracking and kind of went on the defense instead of saying, well, we should ban fracking and we should stop um, producing so many um, contaminants and stuff. But uh, yeah, for me, almost like she was too central, personally. Okay. Well, does anybody have any thoughts about why that's a really difficult? Alex, know? Alex, they have to, they're going to lose way too many votes if they don't keep some of those centralized policies like people like the yeah, moderate people like people in the middle the moderates they're gonna vote for trump still if they if like biden and, and harris don't present some like semi-moderate policies because especially because kamala is so known for being like crazy liberal whereas joe is more moderate yeah. so i think i was kind of upset about the fracking thing too last night but i was like they they have to get as many people 
like the moderates that were voting for Trump in 16 back over to the Democratic or like Democratic ticket. I can see that. Yeah, definitely. Which sucks that the party system works like that. Which and that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Instead of it being based on issues, we're basing it on parties. But which, for example. I am someone that grew up in Europe. I grew up in Spain and we have like six or seven different parties whenever we have elections. So America, as much as some people like to call it radical left, it's actually center and radical right instead of uh, very much left. And as much as that sucks, I do understand why she has to stand in that position. And I was talking about it with my partner today um, because some people are also criticizing her past. Right, And I think that it gets to a point where some of these people to get to where they are have had to have a past. You know, if you're surrounded by people that will sign certain bills and you don't, yes, that is good for for the public and some people will want to support that, but also it might not get you anywhere. So I think that we should be looking at it through more of a positive outlook, like saying, well, let's get what will get us closer to there. Let's start by just taking out the people that don't believe in it at all and putting people that at least some sort of have some sort of solutions. Right. And maybe we can demand for more after yeah. rather than wanting exactly. to just ask for everything all of a sudden. Yeah. I, in many cases, I wish that America was more like Europe. So, yeah. Well, I, I guess a way, one way to think about this is a sort of, there's this need to moderate your, political views uh, in order to accommodate the widest spectrum of, of voters, right? So you don't want to appear too radical because you're afraid of, you know, shifting. So the balance of power is sort of very narrowly distributed within sort of the middle range of possible uh, actions and outcomes. And, you know, the, the fear is that, you know, and that was expressed by this concern about fracking, you know, protect the baby frackers kind of uh, argument that, you know, that that you know was sort of being made by by Biden and I guess by Harris uh, in response to attacks from you know making it appear like you know trying to regulate fracking would be a radical solution and would harm American jobs you know hundreds of thousands of jobs would be lost. But um, some of the solutions that you know climate change uh, require may not be moderate. You know we may have to in in you know a decade or two, it may become necessary to really regulate very forcefully uh, different kinds of activity. For example, um, you know, it may not be economically possible for people to have beachfront houses and, and beachfront property in, you know, in the coming years as we see another hurricane you know, coming for the Lake Charles, Louisiana area, you know, right on the heels of the last one that they had. And so um, you know, there may have to be changes which are you know, different, you know, radically depart from the kinds of sort of moderate, you know, uh, uh, broad spectrum approaches that have been present in the past. And what's gonna happen when that occurs? Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. I'm scared because in America people are, but my freedom, you know, I'm not gonna spend money and give you tax money for that. I am, so hopefully people would accept it and I hope that legislation can be passed, but I feel like some people just, I don't know, they want like freedom essentially to where they don't have to like fund things that they don't want to. So I think that's the big issue going forward in America at least. So, but I agree, I think something radical it has to be done. If it's not done now, it's gonna be even more radical in the future because it's gonna yeah, be Yeah, it's gonna be even harder. You're right. Exactly. It's kind of like, like if you look at the, the COVID stuff because we had never had anything like this before everything seemed radical even like the smallest tiny little changes um but i was just gonna say that um i don't know if you guys heard it kind of like happened while we were in class but there's been some like changes to the next debate they wanted to move it from in person to virtual and trump, and trump, like, said he trump shot do that it. down right away and so i think they just made the call that there's not even going to be a debate next week and we're only going to have like there's going to be one last one and it's going to be on the like the 22nd but we were supposed to have like three debates with with yeah. trump and biden now we're only going to get two which kind of sucks actually it sucks a lot yeah Did any of you catch that pence um mentioned something in a question that was kind of unrelated but he said that 
hurricanes are the same as they've always been. Yes. Nothing has changed and there's the same amount of hurricanes as there has been in the past. And like And we're we're at gamma. Like yeah, in the in the like blatant disregard for scientific facts, like that should be unacceptable at that. But I think that like at least recognizing science, which he said that we should listen to what the science says, which he's certainly not doing. Right. I think that that should be a bare minimum for any sort of candidate to be given the sort of respect to have all of this responsibility on their shoulders. But the blatant disregard for science and facts, which the administration has showed through their entire term, should essentially just be like a huge red flag. Because if you can't genuinely understand the facts, not like fully, because obviously not everybody can understand everything through and through, but like just the, the thought that like, we're gonna go up there and say that hurricanes have stayed the same as they have been. Like, is that really true? Are we gonna say that to everybody? It's just frustrating. Shouldn't that also be penalizable? Like if these people are coming out in national television and straight up lying about um, facts and science, there should be some sort of way to stop it or some sort of policing or some sort of, out of just honestly pure respect to the public because I don't think it's respectful to the people in Louisiana, like have you, how you said, just had a really bad hurricane and have another one coming. And to have somebody on t television telling you, no, we're doing just fine. There's nothing to worry about. Honestly, disrespectful. Like these people are losing their houses. They're, they're losing their property. And I don't know. I just think that it's not being recognized or talked about enough. Agreed. Yeah, I guess the question is, you know, and with respect to climate change, but also with respect to the pandemic, you know, sort of this idea of, well, everything is okay, we're doing the best we could, you know, this is the best of all possible uh, outcomes, and that sort of comes up against the, you know, the reality of, of people dying, the people, people getting sick, and, you know, staying sick, and having, you know, pre-existing conditions that are, you know, those sorts of, you know, those sorts of, uh, you know, cognitive dissonance between, you know, what uh, uh, politicians are saying and what people's lives are actually like, you know, that's a real uh, important factor. But, you know, how does that, apart from personal experience, how does that become part of the, the you know, the national dialogue? How does that become part of an accepted world view? I guess is the question when, you know, so often with, you know, uh, uh, in popular media, uh, social media, you know, everybody's able to sort of pick and choose their own kind of reality in a way. Um, you know, that's a, it's a real sort of interesting moment, isn't it, in, in, in that we're in in the society. I agree. And I also think that the funny part, well, not funny, but the strange thing about this whole situation is that on one hand, some people are so focused on the well-being of the economy and regarding that sort of as like the health of the nation and kind of how Kamala was talking about how um, just because like the economy is healthy from a superficial standpoint are the people who are actually supporting the economy and who are on the front lines working during COVID time is putting their health and their livelihood at risk to like serve other people but you're not going to worry about them and put them first when it comes to actually like making that sacrifice to improve the quality of lives of other people so we're going to keep improving the quality of lives of the people that already have an obscene amount of money and an obscene amount of power yeah, yeah. america's obsessed with the economy so. yeah. and who really who really um the economy who really uh it, who does it really protect right who does it really benefit because it's not benefiting me if i'm out of a job and i i honestly couldn't care less about an economy if i i'm out of a job and i don't have a way to go to the hospital if i need it i don't want to use bad wording you know but like screw the economy like i want health i want to be able to live and eat food and it's a little bit similar to what happened in the french revolution right where the people up top have way too much power and the people in the bottom they were like well you're throwing parties and, and living lavish and we don't even have enough to eat so I don't know, do we have a second French Revolution happening or, or what's yeah. going to change the situation? At one point, we're going to realize you can't eat money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well, here's a question, you know, I mean, and I'm going to add the people that are still around. Uh, I want to ask you to, to, to synthesize this question. So, 
you know, we've looked and we're going to look more at the way in which, um, you know, biodiversity causes a balance within ecosystems that makes them, tends to make them more stable over time. Uh, and so that's one of the, you know, I hope we've made that point or hope that's gotten across is that a, a biodiverse ecosystem, an ecosystem with many different components that are interacting, you know, tends to be more stable than one which is dominated by one or another species. Okay, so we, you know, human domination is causing unstable ecosystems across. The well, can you apply that same thinking to an economy? You know, if an economy is diverse in the sense that you know there's a many people have economic benefits and are benefiting from the from the you know increase in wealth or growth or whatever. Um, that economy is more stable than an economy in which one sector of the society is benefiting hugely and you know the base or the, the broad majority is you know is being left behind. You know the, which which of these which of those pictures is more stable? You know, which, which society, one in which there's a more or less equal distribution or more nearly equal distribution of, of resources and wealth and, and a, a opportunity compared to one in which it's very, very unequal. And because we do have a very unequal economic society at present. Any yeah. thoughts on that? I mean, it does make sense, right? If you have an ecosystem in which you have way too many, for example, in a, in a trophic level that the most uppermost trophic level is very, very full and you don't have enough people or enough, sorry, species at the bottom, the species at the top will not be able to eat. And the other way around, the species at the bottom will overpopulate, right? And I think that there is an imbalance. There's a people with a lot, a lot of money and there's a lot of people with very, very, very little. And I think that more and more the middle part is what's getting um, smaller and smaller, which like you said, is not benefiting an ecosystem because they all have to be in some sort of balance and equilibrium. So there is definitely a comparison to be made. And honestly, it might be a really good way to explain it to some people because um, yeah. nature and animals are easier to understand sometimes than the economy. Um, yeah, that's a good analogy. Okay, all right, cool. Anybody else? So we're just about out of time here. Uh, I do like to stop at, at around two. Um, yeah. Anybody else want to make any comments uh, before we end the class for today? All right. Well, uh, thanks for your participation, and uh, we'll uh, I'll be posting uh, some study guides over the weekend and help you get ready for the test, and then um, uh, hopefully you got something out of today's discussion. All right. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Professor. Bye.